Hey guys, Aaron Farmer here with MySugarFreeJourney.com. We're going to take a look at all of the stories that have come across my desk today. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, before we get into this, that if you could subscribe to the YouTube channel, I would appreciate it, and maybe share this video with your friends. All right, first article, Nutritional Psychiatry, Can You Eat Yourself Happier? So this is a subject I've been interested in for a while. Can what Does what you eat affect your mental mood? Does it affect your... Um, your ability to be, to be depressed or to be optimistic. Uh, and of course, I've made the comment and, and uh, many, many times that yes, it absolutely does. What you eat affects your mental outlook. So this article is about Felice Jacka's work uh, showing that junk food shrinks the brain. You need to uh, take a look at that. So uh, for her PhD study in 2010, Jacka found that women whose diets were higher in vegetables fruit, fish, and whole grains with moderate amounts of red meat were less likely to have depression or anxiety disorders than those who consumed a typical Western diet of processed foods, pizza, chips, burgers, white bread, and sweet drinks. Okay, so I want to make this very clear because I think sometimes I don't do a good job of saying this. The dividing line between what is good healthy food and bad unhealthy food is not... Um, you know, carnivore versus a vegan diet or, or whatever, that, or a ketogenic diet versus, a, you know, a, a typical sad American diet. The dividing line between good food and bad food is real food and food that has been invented in the last, you know, 100 years that, that is heavily processed. So you can have a diet that's not ketogenic, that has plenty of vegetables, plenty of fruit, fish, whole grains, although I, I would debate the whole grains, um, um, archival grains or, or uh, ancestral grains, maybe. Uh, but most most of what's on our shelves today that we call whole grains, I, I don't think is healthy. But um, those are, for the most part, real foods, whole foods, good foods, and you can eat them and not be sick. Unless you're starting from a place where you're already sick, and in that case, you probably have to go more drastic, you know, you're going to have to maybe go with a very, very low carb diet or a ketogenic diet in order to lose weight. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so eating a real food diet will, has been shown to improve your mental health and your, and your mental outlook, uh, your mental well-being. When I first started, people were terribly skeptical. This is back to the article. They thought it was just rubbish. In psychiatry, people are trained to think about particular molecules in the brain that can be targeted by certain drugs, and they lost sight of the bigger picture, the body as a whole complex system. We see the story over and over and over again where doctors want to treat one specific problem with one specific drug, and they don't think about the, the other things that are at play. You're not one specific problem that, that can be treated with one specific drug. You are a whole person, and you need to do things that affect the whole person. Now, I'm not anti-drugs. I'm not anti-doctors, but I am saying the first line of defense for almost any long-term chronic disease, whether we're talking about depression or arthritis or cancer or uh, type 2 diabetes, the first line of defense should be a diet that has has nothing but real whole foods in it. And if you need to lose weight, if you need to get rid of your type 2 diabetes, that should probably be uh, not just whole foods, but whole foods that don't have any, that don't raise your insulin levels. And then you're going to see massive, massive benefits. Uh, and then one unexpected finding of her PhD study, for example, was that cutting out red meat led to poor mental health among the 1,000 participants. Cutting out red meat led to poor mental health outcomes. Of course, this makes total sense. What is your brain made out of? It's made out of fat, okay? You need to eat a diet that has plenty of fat, plenty of protein. That's what your brain is made out of. That It just makes sense that that's what your brain needs in order to, um, in order to be healthy. What are you made out of, okay? Are you made out of fat? Are you made out of protein? Or are you made out of leaves and carrots and you know ve vegetables? You're, you're not made out of those things. Doesn't mean they can't be a part of your diet, but the majority of your diet needs to be what you're made out of. The majority of your diet needs to be red meat. All right, let's move on. 
and oh felisa jackie if you uh felice jacka 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 sorry if you happen to see this video i'd love to have you on the podcast she's got a new book out that's mentioned in the uh in this article the name of which i forget right now but i uh, would love to have you on talk about the book all right, moving on. The combined presence of hypertension and vitamin D deficiency increased the, the probability of the occurrence of small vessel disease in China. So let's take a look at this. The, I'm just going to skip right to the conclusion. You can read the whole, uh, whole article on your own time. We found significant associations between small vessel disease and vitamin D deficiency. The combined presence of hypertension and vitamin D deficiency increased the probability of developing small vessel, small vessel disease. Our findings will warrant further prospective studies in the future. So I thought this was interesting for a couple of reasons. Number one, when you have someone who is deficient in vitamin D and you give them a vitamin D capsule to raise the blood levels of their vitamin D, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have as strong a benefit as we would expect. And I think the reason for this is because I don't think that that high or adequate levels of vitamin D are uh, I think I think adequate levels of vitamin D are a proxy for something else. And the reason why I think that is because every time we artificially raise vitamin D levels, uh, there's there's been several studies done where we've artificially raised vitamin D levels. We've given patients that are low in vitamin D pills in order to raise the vitamin D levels in their blood. We've raised it to what we think are normal levels and we're not seeing the benefits of these of these higher uh, vitamin D um, levels in their health that we would expect to see. And the reason why I think this is, is because pay, uh, people with naturally higher levels of vitamin D are those, that vitamin, those high vitamin D levels are a proxy for the fact that they are going outside in the sun and probably exercising or doing something with their body. That so that when you when somebody comes into a doctor's office with with the normal vitamin D levels, it doesn't mean that they've got normal vitamin D levels. That's not the good thing. The good thing is pro is they probably got those high vitamin D levels because they went outside, they exposed themselves to the sun, and they got exercise and the people who have done that are showing less uh, showing uh, less small vessel disease, probably because they're leaving they're they're uh, living a much healthier life and they're going outside and getting exercise. So go outside, get some exercise. If you need high vitamin D, I mean, if you need uh, to increase your vitamin D, I'm not saying that you shouldn't take a vitamin D capsule. If you want to do that, that's fine. But don't don't get your health from a pill. It it just doesn't work out. It just doesn't work out very well ever. Get your health by doing the things that God intended us to do. Go outside, garden, you know, lift some weights outside, you know, throw things around, do something with your body, and uh, get natural sun exposure. Get a little exercise, and raise your vitamin D levels the old-fashioned way. Um, the next article, Discovering How Diabetes Leads to Vascular Disease. thought this was very interesting. Um, this gets a little technical, but we'll break it down here in a minute. The research is focused on the relationship between protein kinase A and adenylene cyclase, 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 an enzyme involved in cyclic AMP production. Don't, don't worry. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the important part here in, in, uh, in a minute. The results show that one AC in particular, that's the adenylene cyclase, AC5, mediated uh, CMP and PKA, uh, that's the protein kinase A, uh, A activation, triggering increased calcium channel activity and blood vessel narrowing. Anyway, so they found this cascade of events. Um, the team now hopes to test the effects of the AC5 chain reaction in high glucose targets in Human cells. So basically, they found they found the mechan the uh, they think they found the chain of events that happens when blood glucose levels are high that lead inevitably to high um, high uh, blood pressure. And if they did that, that's great. If they can find a, a, a pill that will you know help people that are uh, eating terrible diets kind of delay the onset of these the small vessel disease, so they can. You know, diabetic patients can keep their eyes for longer, not, not have to go blind, not have to get their toes chopped off, not have to get their legs chopped off. We don't want anybody to have to get body parts removed or lose function in these very important body parts. 
Um, you know, if, if uh, we can come up with a pill that will help with that, great. But you don't have to wait for a pill. There are things you could do right now today to reduce your risk of getting small vessel disease. Don't eat sugar. Don't eat grains. Don't eat polyunsaturated fats. And do eat as much red meat in your diet as you want. And you'll see a lot of these benefits. And um, if you do that and you see a drop in your blood pressure, tell me. I would love to hear about that. Next up, the low-carb, high-fat ketogenic diet may boost for fertility for those struggling to conceive. I thought this was interesting because she kind of goes through, the, the person who wrote the article went through a lot of the stuff that we already know um, about how a ketogenic diet can help um, with, uh, can help with uh, what do you call it, uh, with fertility. Uh, it can uh, make insulin resistance better. Uh, increase pituitary dysfunction or uh, you know, improve pituitary dysfunction, uh, can uh, re reduce elevated levels of the hormone androgen and DHEA, it can improve body composition, all stuff that we know. Um, Will Cole is, uh, Dr. Will Cole is quoted as saying the standard American diet filled with refined carbohydrates and sugar has been associated with poor sperm health, negatively impacting sperm motility, morphology, and shape count. Uh, so this is interesting uh, that diet doesn't just affect the woman, it affects the man too. It makes both women and men, a uh, standard American diet can make both women and men less fertile. Um, but she ends it with, and this was the part that, that really you know, tickled me because uh, she ends it with the Mediterranean diet, which emphasizes fruit, vegetables, meat, fish, whole wheat, carbs, and and healthy fats is thought to be ideal for preconception, the, the time before a woman gets pregnant, because carbs are a primary source of fuel for a growing baby. I thought that was funny because we know that uh, babies are born in a ketogenic state. Uh, they're fed a high-fat diet. That's what a, you know, breast milk is, is a high-fat diet. And uh, babies pretty much live in a ketogenic state until we start uh, giving them food that they probably shouldn't eat. And yet here's something right here that says that carbs are the primary source of fuel for a growing baby. Carbs aren't the primary source of fuel for a growing baby. I don't know where that came from or why they said that. Um, I would say that she does say that, you know, you don't want a, a mother that's pregnant or, you know, th to start going into a ketogenic state. That's probably true because a pregnant woman has, they have enough going on. Um, they don't. They don't want to go through that transition period of, uh, of you know, switching over to a ketogenic state. I know women who have done it, and you know they've they went through like champions. But you know, I don't know that I would ever recommend that, just because it it, it is it, it can be difficult for a woman to go through that transition into a ketosis if they're already pregnant. But if you do decide to do that, it's not going to hurt anything. Consult with your doctor. Blah blah blah. Uh, and finally, nutrition science is broken. This new egg study shows why. And it kind of goes through this history of, you know, we told we were told eggs were bad because they raised cholesterol. And then we were told eggs were good because they were an excellent source of protein, lutein, all these vitamins and minerals, riboflavin and selenium. And then this March, a study published in JAMA put the egg back on the hot seat. It found that the amount of cholesterol in a bit less than two large eggs a day was associated with the increase in a person's risk of cardiovascular disease and death by 17 and 18 percent, respectively. The risk grow with every additional half egg. Dun, dun, dun. One half egg increases your chance of just dropping dead from a heart attack. It was a really large study with nearly 30,000 participants, which suggests it should be fairly reliable. And the person who wrote this article, I should, I should say their name because they did a really good job. Um, uh, 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 Timothy Kern did a very, very good job uh, breaking down the problems with these uh, observational studies. And then he finally gets to this study in particular. In particular, the study tracked participants. So I was talking about the one, the study I just mentioned. The study tracked participants' health outcomes over periods ranging from 13 to more than 30 years, and, particip and participants were, were queried about their diet only once at the beginning of the study. Can we assume that the participants gave a reliable depiction of their diet at the outset, and then that they maintained that diet for the years, in many cases decades, that followed? Probably not. Who eats the same way for 10 years? Who can, who can track all that? And, of course, they put the, uh, they put the problem 
uh, for these cardiovascular events on eggs and not the stuff that gets eaten with eggs like hash browns and pancakes and all of the other kind of junk. Um, you know, since I've been in ketosis, I, uh, or since I've been eating a low carb diet, uh, I still, I mean, breakfast is my favorite meal of the day and getting them to not bring carbs to the table when I order, um, you know, I usually order my, uh, omelet with a bunch of meat and cheese, uh, getting them to not bring biscuits or toast or pancakes or the, you know, all the other carbs, the potatoes that they want to bring. It's difficult. It, you know, it, and if you're just kind of a normal American going and eating your two or three, um, egg omelet when you go to uh when you go out to eat or or whatever um it's unfair that the egg gets the blame for these cardiovascular events and not the all, all the other crap that gets eaten along with it or the sugar that they're putting in their coffee uh, or the orange juice that they're drinking with it all of that stuff has its own problems the problem again the problem is not the eggs the problem is not the eggs the problem is not the animal product the problem is the crap. The problem is the fake food that gets served along with it. Eat real food and you're going to be okay. Okay, uh, so I'm going to put links to all of these articles in the uh, in the post I'm going to do with it. There's a link here in the information section below the video. Click over that. Come over if you want to read these for yourself. I would definitely recommend this last one that we talked about, about the science of eggs, because, uh, like I said, the author did a really good job of of uh, breaking down some of the problems with these observational studies. Uh, please remember to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and say something. I love comments. If you have something to say, say it. Even if you disagree with me, I would love to talk to you. All right, guys, I appreciate you watching, and we will talk to you later. Bye-bye. Well, I don't know how to turn this thing off. Oh, here it is. Thanks.